CJ, grace and peace to you. It's good to finally actually get to talk to you. Yeah, no kidding. I feel like we've we've talked about talking more than we've talked. <laughs> yes, yes. It doesn't help that I only I only get on here like once every two weeks or whatever it is. So I'm not super active, and you're crazy active, which is super cool. Yeah, um, not as much recently as I'd like to be, but that's partially because I want to kind of revamp everything, and once I get going, make it a lot more professional. Hopefully by the first, but um, but yeah, I've been you know pretty much always can find me somewhere either in the comment section or in a debate or, or something. Yeah, yeah, man. Uh, yeah, I, I enjoy your shows and your debates and all that. I appreciate that. I am definitely not a debater. I am not organized. Um, I get sidetracked. I start talking about one point and then I'm um, kind of like that dog squirrel. And I, I get lost in my thoughts and I'd be a horrible debater. If I was actually doing like a moderated debate, it'd be, it'd be bad. I'd fail miserably. Well, brother, that's what PowerPoints <laughs> are for. I'm dead serious. Uh, if I, if I didn't, if I didn't write down what I'm talking about, believe me, I wouldn't have any idea. <laughs> I, I am a, uh, I, I don't know what it is. I am horrible with note taking as well. Too, it take a lot of effort, and uh, I'm I'm okay. I'm good. Call me lazy. I, I don't know. I'm good. I'll leave it to the professionals like CJ to, to debate. See, I just try to have really good, strong points because I don't really have time. I work seventy hours a week, so. I'm just like, yeah, I know I got these points. You're not going to beat them. If you're dumb enough to debate me, I'll debate you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm pretty busy, too, so I can understand that. But yeah, uh, honestly, I don't have time to be throwing in a lot of debates. I have one coming up on the 19th with old Kevin from Kevin's Biblical Discussions. But, oh, yes. frankly, that's the uh, first official debate I've done all year. And I highly doubt I'll be doing much, if any, in 2024. Right. And that that is on um, – no, no, hold on. It's on um, election, election, right? No, it's, uh, it's funny. Kevin's changed the debate topic thrice, but the current one on which he seems to have settled is the thesis – is pre double predestination is a doctrine of demons. Oh, that's right. That's right. Okay. That's right. It's is double predestination demonic doctrine. And he is asserting that not only is it, but that if you're a double predestinarian and or a Calvinist, that you are actually unsaved. But if you came into double predestinarianism and or Calvinism, then you are somehow saved. So that should be interesting to see how he can flesh that out. Yeah, I'll be uh, I'll be keeping an eye out for that debate for sure. Um, yeah, I don't know if I would affirm double predestination. To be honest, I don't know. I don't... What is double predestination? Well, that's going to be an interesting discussion because in trying to ask for clarification in the form of what Kevin believes that's and kind of weird because he, he seems to think that means fatalism and that's not what we think, but it simply would be the affirmation generally speaking. Notice I say generally speaking that God has chosen some to salvation and others he has not. He has reprobated them. The majority of Protestants would affirm this in the form of the Reformed and there are some exemptions, or ex uh, there are some non-reformed folks that affirm that as well. But I'll save that for the debate. Ryan, also, they were you, created for, for this purpose. Well, hello, Kevin. Pleasure to see you again, too. And again, I, 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 what, I don't what, appreciate among, you lying about what, me. what among the multitude of things that you accuse me of lying about you have I now lied this time? When when did I say if you believe in double predestination, you're not saved? You've already said that if you believe in Calvinism, you're not saved, and you're. I did not say that, sir. Yes, you you're have. Me. I, I said, I, if, "Have you? Have good. you on praise Play the channel? Play it in context. I, I said I people that believe that Calvinism channel. 
one and two. people that believe that excuse me people that believe that calvinism is the gospel probably aren't saved because then it would well, be then, a false gospel then you're changing what you said and even still, i said that on the very stream you're talking no, about i said you, calvinism you, is you not changed the gospel. you're oh. changing what you said three or four times but nonetheless if i That's say it, right? kevin just to give you an illustration if someone believes in O sats, then they're unsaved. But if they believed in O sats and stopped believing in it, then they might be saved. I'm saying the same thing that you're saying. Come on now. No, you're you're really not because I've stated Calvinism isn't the gospel, it's a theological position to understand soteriology. Yeah, and, and the gospel you, is the life, death, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. And if you put your faith in him, you are saved. Well, now, if someone says tulip is the gospel, then they have a false gospel and they are not saved. Do you understand that? Does that make sense to you? No, I, I understand what you're saying. I don't think you understand the logical implications of what you're saying, but we can save that for the 19th. Goodness gracious. CJ, am I making sense to you? Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, and, and I will say as a, I don't I'm not aware of the the video Ryan is referencing, but I will say, uh, despite our own very heavy disagreements on this issue, um, I I would be willing to give Kevin the benefit of the doubt here because he's never, at least with me, has never claimed that my Calvinism puts me outside of the the confines of faith. No, uh, I wouldn't say that. It's like someone like Sonny Hernandez. I would because he openly admits um, that his form of hyperdeterminism is indeed the gospel. Free will is just an illusion. Um, so yeah, he he definitely has a false gospel for sure. Are, I are you talking about Sonny Hernandez from Reforming America Ministries, a Hispanic fellow? Uh, yeah. That he's a textbook hyper Calvinist. In fact, I know he would he would go so far as to say that. CJ and I are probably reprobate status because we're willing to grant that Arminians are not necessarily unsaved by virtue of being Arminians. So that that is very much in the hyper Calvinist vein. Now he does he does say he is a high Calvinist. He does. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't. I thought that was weird terminology because I don't think you could be. Usually, when I hear the term high Calvinist, it's used in context of the classically reformed so like presbyterian and dutch reformed and, and high anglican and stuff like that versus uh general calvinist or low calvinist which tends to be reformed baptist or some flavor of non-denominational reformed so when he's using high or some calvinist, anglicans it, yeah exactly or some of the the low church anglicans as well um so when he's using the phrase high calvinism to refer to a, a hyper determinism rather than doctrines of, like it, it, to illustrate my point in case nobody's getting it in, in the usage I'm familiar with I have a high because Ryan's a Presbyterian and therefore adheres to the classical doctrine whereas I would probably be a little stricter in my definition of Calvinism by defining it through means of like two of um yeah, it's a tiny bit hard to hear you, CJ. I think you're unwittingly covering your mic a bit every several words or so. You, yeah, you sound a little bit muffled there, CJ. Oh, sorry about that. Um, let me put my headphones in really quick and see if that helps. Are you at work? Hmm. Excuse me. Uh, no, I just I'm on my phone at the moment, and the phone can be ah rough when I'm trying to. Yeah. So, I'm waiting Ryan, while CJ's, uh, while CJ's doing that, I want to clarify. So, the debate will be on double predestination. Well, I'm taking the position that it's not, and you're taking the position that it is. So, I, you I've, are, I've already said the position that I'm taking, and I don't know why we have to do this at someone else's panel and interrupt their conversation. Well, you brought it up, so I just want to clarify so there's no misunderstanding. Uh huh. All right. Well, I think people on this panel is curious anyway, so I because I would ask later, so it just saves me the trouble. Perhaps. Now, what exactly? <laughs> what what exactly were you discussing? Um, what exactly were you discussing there, Mister SS Twenty One? Since we've got uh, off the beaten track. 
Uh, nothing in particular. We can talk about whatever. I'm, I'm, I'm open to whatever. Um, well, it's a pleasure to see you again, brother. You never did get a hold of me, by the way. Oh, I, I have, I have your number. I'm just lazy. I'll, I'll eventually get to it. Ah, uh, the la- <laughs> are, are, so, are, so you're admitting uh, on camera that you're the lazy Calvinist? Mm, for very, shame, very. For shame, for shame. Oh, Ryan, I'm just curious. Are you a um, confessional Presbyterian? Do you hold to the Westminster? Yes, I've, I've said that many times. All right, just just double checking. All right. Yes, I, I am that, curious that would, about something. That, that well, would, go ahead, yeah. guys. I, I, if I, would, I may, I was going to respond to CJ. Ironically, and I can say this because CJ's here without picking on him, CJ would technically be a low Calvinist because although he affirms most of the soteriological ideals of Calvinism, he doesn't particularly hold to any of the reform creeds, the three, the three forms of unity, the, pre, the Westminster Standards, the second Helvetic confession, or perhaps even if I were to be very generous in how I use the word reformed, the London Baptist confessions, first or second, what have you. So as a result of that, although I'm willing to obviously grant that CJ is a is Calvinistic, he's actually not confessional. And it's pretty obvious when you listen to us dialogue from time to time that because of that, we do have some pretty notable disagreements. So, Ryan, can you understand your faith and stuff without these confessions? Well, that's... Uh, do, you, do you understand what the point of a confession would be, Kevin? It's, it's just a statement of what we believe. It's something the early church has done since the time of the apostles. So, in other words, it's just like a lengthy statement of faith? What you're saying? Yes, I mean, what, 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 do you, what did Peter say when Jesus asked him who he was? Who do you say that I am? And Peter said, what? You are the Christ, the Son of that, God. Yes, that's a confession. Okay. Just so what? Someone had a question. So I think it was. What oh yeah, I you... did have a question because Veckel wouldn't answer this, and he just kind of dodged it. I like because I don't understand how there's salvation in Calvinism. Like, at what point were you heading to hell? Like, what point did God determine you to go to hell? No, I mean, I mean this is a serious question. What time? Because because in order to be saved from something, you had to be heading there. But it seems like under your ideology, you were never heading there because you were always determined to go to heaven, right? That 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 is not what any Calvinist would believe. I'm I'm sorry, my friend. No, I know. Well, that's why I'm asking this. I just don't understand. Ryan, it's a legit question because Matt Slickus. Okay, um, I'm I'm trying I'm trying to answer somebody and I can't talk. I'll wait. Well, I was I'm just waiting. saying it's a legit question because he Matt will. Slick asserts that the, the elect are, are born with their debt already uh, canceled. Well, yes, and you you went on there with him to say the debt's not canceled until they believed. He asked you specifically Correct. if the debt was canceled 2,000 years ago. You said no, not until they believe. Right, it's offered as a gift. Right, which means the debt still is on their heads, Kevin. But that's Until another. they come to faith, yes. And and that no, that's no, a, that's like disagree no, with that. No, 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 born that with your that's a, that's another life. discussion from what the question I was just asked. So I've got two people talking to me, wanting to talk about two different things. I can't. No, talk it's the to same you point. I'm adding to the conversation okay. because Chris is I, saying, I'm, "How are you in a real danger?" Of I'm hell just trying to born answer. with your debt canceled. That's all. I'm yeah, just trying to help. I'm just trying to answer one person if I can. I can't talk to two people simultaneously. I'm sorry. Now, be very precise, please, if you don't mind, Chris, so we know that we're understanding each other. Please reiterate what you just said. Okay. At what point were you heading to hell as a Calvinist? (laughs) I'm heading to hell and deserving of hell without Christ. Because I lack his righteousness, because I am dead in my sin from the federal headship of Adam. But weren't you always determined to be elect? Do you so you were never really saved, right? Do, well, do you understand what, what things are? A, what the word determined means, and B, what a circular argument would be? 
Well, I, I to me, determined just means God can understand what's going to happen. But then I'm, I mean, I believe that God gave people free will and he can understand what's going to happen despite the free will he yeah. gave people. And do you, um, under, and do look, you, do you oh, go understand ahead, go ahead. what it, and I ask you another question. Do you understand what circular reasoning would be? Right. Yes. It's kind of, uh, I, I understand what circular reasoning is. Yeah. Right. Do you understand why I'm saying that? Because I am. No, 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 that I do not. I am giving you the standard answer. Every single Protestant will affirm this Arminian or Calvinist or even the Lutherans. The reason we need salvation is simple. We are born dead because of our father, Adam. He sinned and we died in him because he is our federal head. And we need redemption because we are the sons of Adam and not the sons of God. We become sons of God through adoption by faith alone on the Lord Jesus Christ alone. Okay, maybe I should put it this way. Let's say you have a factory, it blows up. It's got, it, it creates something, it's got wings, wheels, and engine. Someone gets in it and they go, hey, this doesn't work right, it doesn't fly. Well, this explosion that has no mind, it, when it created this, it had no purpose in mind, so you can't say whether it's working right or wrong, right? But let's say I create something, you get in it, you fl you drive it up and down the road real fast, but you're like, hey, it doesn't fly. Well, I go, did it go up and down the road real fast? You go, yes, it did. I go, that's exactly why I designed it to do, so it is working right. So we got right and wrong established there. This is why you can't have, uh, like, why atheists can't argue that, that there's morality. You, just this real simple argument. Okay, now I'll take it okay, one step okay. further and apply it to Calvinists, because you say God determined everything. Well, if God determined you to no, do no, everything, no, you don't no, have a free no, will. No, 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 How can no. you say there's right and wrong? Hold okay, on. You, How can you say there's right and wrong are, if you're you are determined asserting, to do all these things? Because you're doing exactly you are, what you were created to do. You are passionately asserting something that we disbelieve. Well, right. How else to tell you that? Uh, John well, Calvin, you said there's no said free will. John Calvin if said there's no. I, 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 hold on. I, is, I, hold on. Okay. Is there free will I'm, in I'm Calvinism? Going, I'm going to say this only one more time. I cannot talk to multiple people. I can't do that. We have one, right, two, just, three, four people on the panel. I we got that. Look, I just want to know why. It, what, hold on. You, we, you do you believe? Okay, you, is there free will or not? Is there free will or not in the Calvinism? Question's been answered to you multiple times. Yes. Okay. There's no that, free will. That's why I just no. Said. I did. Good Lord, man! I didn't even finish answering you. You you just want to hear what you want to hear. Calvin no, affirms, you said you answered it. No, Go I ahead. said the question has been answered multiple times to you. Not that I answered it, but multiple other people have answered this, and you just don't care for the answer. So I'm just going to reiterate very basic reform doctrine. Yes, we believe that man has a free will, which is dead in sin and affected by the fall. In regeneration, that will is made more like Christ, and it grows and grows in sanctification until the day of glorification, the day when Christ comes for his sheep. We deny as a result, however, that that will has any capacity to participate with man's regeneration. He will not choose to believe in Jesus unless the word and the spirit act upon that person. You have so, the freedom to say it another way, to put the shirt on that you chose to put on this morning, but you don't have the freedom to put on salvation. Please go ahead, CJ. Yes, yeah, so... The, so Ryan is is right that the the Calvinist will, with the exception of people like Sonny Hernandez, Calvinists do affirm uh, free will, although they'll typically call it something more technical like free volition or free moral agency. Um, the difference between the Calvinist and the non-Calvinist does not lie in an affirmation of free will per se, but lies in the affirmation of a specific philosophical brand of free will, whether that be libertarian or compatibilist, right? So the libertarian says that free will exists and that free will is incompatible with determinism, which the fatalist, by the way, says the same thing, but on the other side, he says that determinism is true, but that that is incompatible with free will. Uh, the Calvinist affirmation is that free will exists and that this is compatible 
with divine determinism and, and to briefly quote the Westminster Confession would be just because it does lay this out. It says, um, God, and I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but I'm trying to quote it as much as I can off memory. Um, God has freely ordained whatsoever comes to pass, um, yet thereby is violence not done to the creature, nor the agency of second causes uh, yeah, you, taken away, but established. You'd be right. talking about uh, three, chapter three, paragraph two. Exactly. Um, now, to give an example of, of what, what exactly is meant there then, um, a little bit more succinctly, right? So the Calvinist would say that mankind's will is free, but it's limited within the confines, not only by the confines of the decree, of course, but more specifically within the confines of its own, of his own nature, right? So whether you're a libertarian or a compatibilist, we both agree you do not have the free will to flap your wings and fly because you don't have wings, right? So it's outside of your nature to flap your wings and fly because you're not a bird or a bat or some other winged creature, and therefore it's just not something you're capable of doing. Now, of course, you you know you could say, well, I can get on a plane or something like that, but that's why I worded it specifically, flap your wings and fly, right? Um, so what the, what the compatibilist is saying is in that same vein, mankind's nature is such that he is, that the, the thoughts of his heart are only evil continually from his youth, uh, and that we, of our own free volition, will never come to a salvific knowledge of Christ, right? Um, and, and if That's the, correct. And, and thank you for that. And, and by the way, if the example I gave about the flapping your wings and fly doesn't suffice because it's, it's, that's a physical nature, whereas what I'm describing is more of a moral or spiritual nature, we could also use the example of God's ability to lie, right? Um, Jesus, of course, had vocal cords and a tongue and lips and, and a mind, and he knew what truth right. was and therefore he knew what the inverse of truth was so it's not that he's incapable of lying in some form of like mental or physical capacity why he's the reason he's incapable of lying is because it is not within his nature to lie and it and that's just as right. true when he is uh it, before he's incarnate as when he is incarnate right so in the same way the calvinist would say it is not within our nature to freely submit to the savior um, hence why we would affirm something along the lines of total depravity and thereby regeneration must therefore precede faith. Right. So here, here's another way that Calvinists, as we must be called that, have said it from the first head of doctrines, Article 9 out of the Canons of Dort. The same election took place not on the basis of foreseen faith, or of the obedience of, first, excuse me, let me start over. The same election took place, not on the basis of foreseen faith, of the obedience of faith, of holiness, or of any good quality and disposition, as though it were based on a prerequisite cause or condition in the person to be chosen, but rather for the purpose of faith, or the obedience of faith, or holiness and glory. Accordingly, Scripture most appropriately ascribes this glory either God's grace, to the <clears throat> entirely rather to God's grace, to the praise of God's glory. So, I, I've been in and out. Uh, do excuse me for that. I, I had to let the dog out, and then I come back, and I'm, I'm about to get here, and then the cat starts hawking up a hairball, so I throw him out. Ah, um, so I, I miss a lot of the con <laughs> yeah, I miss a lot of the conversation. Uh, we but well, we had a bit of a passionate exchange where. To some level, Kevin wanted to insert his thoughts after accusing me for the umpteenth time of lying about him. And then I guess clarify some of his positions for some reason when he could have done that privately, but oh well. Um, Chris had some questions about which he became very impassioned. And unfortunately, as I was trying to answer some of them, since they were immediately directed at me, we had a bit of over talking going on between Kevin and uh, Chris, so I was simply trying to navigate through that. CJ contributed as well. So it it, it seems that, uh, and do correct me if I'm wrong, but an important point to prove from the scriptures with the Calvinist system would be regeneration precedes faith. That seems pretty important, right? Yes. Is it is it the cornerstone of Reformed theology? No, but it is necessary 
we, I mean, how could we say you're dead in your sins now believe? You know, it's right. clearly not Reformed theology. And so, I mean, uh, at least with, uh, and I'm not sure what, what Chris asked, but that might be a good point to, to go to if that is proper. Well, my whole thing was basically the whole determination because when I hear the whole determination thing, it always comes about like God's God's sovereign, he determined everything. You know, you know, it's like he set in motion everything. He he decided everything, everybody's uh, you know, um, everything is determined. To me it just sounds like once you say something like that, that um, at that point, no one's doing right or wrong because everyone's doing according to what God created them to do, the purpose in mind. And, and if you create something with a purpose in mind, you cannot sit there and say, oh, it's working wrong. No, you created it that way. It's behaving just like you created it. Therefore, it's working right. You cannot say it at that point unless – Unless you give it a free will. Now, if you give it a free will, suddenly if I create something and I and, and, and I let it have a free will and it goes against the free will I gave it. I mean, it goes against the design I gave it like I designed it to do this, but it's just stopping or it's uh, it, or, or it's just designed to do whatever it wants, going in circles, not even going at all. OK, well, uh, now it's working wrong because that's not what I designed it to do. I did give it a free will, but I did not design it to do that. Well, and, and this is a very long winded way of accusing us of believing in fatalism, which we just explained to you that we reject. So, would, would, Chris, would you say that uh, you're defining determinism as uh, we are pre-programmed? Would that be a way you define determinism? Well, that's kind of how it's been told to me. So, yeah. Well, no, it, we're, we're not asking you what you perceive that people have told you. That's different. We're asking how you, Chris, define the term determinism. Well, yeah, it's uh, that's why I keep saying it sounds like pantheism to me. Like we're all God because we don't have a free will. It's just the whole thing of not having a free will because free will solves everything. Okay, because as soon as Chris, you say Chris, something, Scott, free will. We we asked you a question. We didn't ask right. you what you perceive about what other people are telling you. How does Chris? Right, I just told you what I believe right there. If you don't have a free will, I I, I, I it's it becomes pantheism to me. Right, and that's what you said you believe, but you still didn't answer the actual question. Ask. Okay, what was the what was the question then? How does Chris Lucas define determinism? That everything is decided. That um, you're just already kind of you're already pre-programmed, and maybe you just don't consciously know it. But you're, I mean, it's, or I don't know how you guys do it because it, to me it just doesn't make sense because the world doesn't work whoa, whoa, like whoa, whoa, that. Whoa, whoa, whoa. We're not, we're not asking for opinion. We just asked for how you define it. So you said that you think all things are decided and pre-programmed. Is that accurate? Um, is that how you define determinism? That is. Yeah, that, that like God already determined how everything's going to go, just like the the examples you make about writing a book, you know, and everything's just following the script. Right, and you you are accusing the reformed of believing that. Is that correct? Yeah, because I've heard it's like you know it's kind of like a movie, and we're just living it. I would. Yeah, well, that's not what any Calvinist believes. But please go on, sola scriptura. Oh, I, I'm, I'm just saying it seems that um, at the – when we talk about, uh, I guess you say God's will and man's will, um, it seems both sides will ultimately have to get into some philosophical type of debate. But what I do see from the scriptures is at the very least a type of determinism that I guess you could say is uh, – uh, well, I don't know if this would be the right word, dynamic determinism or a de de determinism that doesn't program but is open and functions with or somehow doesn't interfere with the will of man. Not sure if that is an accurate way. So, for, for example, here in Daniel 12, verse 10 it says many shall purify themselves and make themselves white and 
be refined, but the wicked shall act wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand. So there seems to be, there is this group that is going to be wicked. We don't know who those wicked are, but there's a group that will be wicked and will act wickedly and will not understand. Then there's this other group here that is going to purify themselves and make themselves white and refined. Knowing that determinism or determination of God, um, he obviously knows who those two groups are. So in that sense, it is determined. But yet we still function and we still clearly have wills and desires and a nature in this life. But somehow we still make all these choices and, make, and have this will. And yet it still goes according to God's determination. I don't know if that rambling made any sense or not. Well, I have no idea what you said since I was away, but I'm not going to be staying much longer. I have an appointment quite early in the morning, and it's already after 2 o'clock. Yes, yeah, fair. You take care, Ryan. Oh, no, I'm not leaving immediately, but I won't oh, okay. be staying very much longer. Okay. Yeah. Uh, no, I was just trying to explain how I see God's will and man's will. Act interacting or functioning, and I can't describe it that well. Well, it's um, simple. God, every Christian should acknowledge that God is the first cause and first mover of all things. Right. And from there, we must then acknowledge that what happens with men happens because of the first agent and cause. But we also have, because we have free will creatures existing, if you will, P2 human beings that we have a secondary agency and a secondary causation that is subject to the previous first mover and first cause, such that while we can say that God decrees all things, God is not responsible for the actions of his creatures. So for example, if some disgusting person were to do as was done in New York several years ago, where they mow down a large number of civilians in a van by just running them over god is not responsible for the murder because god is not the agent at work there it is the depraved right. human right. being who is acting according to his sin so i right. try to explain this to our non-reformed friends and for some reason you can say that unto your blue in the face in as many ways as possible to help them understand and somehow they don't get it but it nevertheless does not invalidate the fact that we are not fatalists we do not receive doctrines like equal ultimacy or an islamic view of predestination which is actually fatalism where god is actively decreeing and ordaining not only everything that comes to pass but actively decreeing and ordaining the instance that I just said, or say, for example, I, a window cleaner falling from the 63rd floor of a uh, sky, razor, or sky rise onto the 43rd floor, where there happens to be a ledge, barely alive. The Christian would say, hurry up quickly and get some help for this man. He's going to be clinging to life, though it looks like he's alive. The Muslim would say, let Allah's will be done. And don't help him. Because in their worldview, God has decreed that to happen. And who are we to intervene? Yeah, but I think the Muslim would also argue in their worldview, God could also decree you to go help them too. To be there to help them. Well, no, it, it, in practice, that is not typically how they think overseas. If a, like I said, if a man fell from the 63rd to the 43rd floor of a sky rise as he was the window cleaner doing his job, whether or not it's intentional, it's an equipment failure, it's an accident, it's a gust of wind, whatever the cause behind the incident could be, the Islamic attitude, historically speaking, has not been, go help that man. It is, Allah's will be done. There's no getting around that. And to kind of add to that a little bit, the one of the things that is is important to note in the reformed view, 
which to be fair, I, I don't want to, to try and like paint a picture that it is not a deterministic worldview. It certainly is a deterministic worldview. I, I mean, the first uh, paragraph of the Westminster Confession is quite clear. But the affirmation from the perspective of the, uh, of the Reformed is that this is simply the nature of a uh, creator-creature relationship such that it is necessary God has determined all things but that the way in which he is able to accomplish these things is through secondary causations, which can include, Correct. but will not necessarily always include, human free will. Of course, there's other things like, Correct. you know, the weather and stuff like that. But but you Correct. get the idea, right? So, so when somebody asks the question, okay, well, and I'll just give an explicit example that's from Scripture. Well, did was Judas, uh, Judas, excuse me. Judas, Judas. That's a, I know, you right? imagine Judas priest? Like, <laughs> what is this? The El Cheapo version of Jesuitism? Or, yeah, exactly. You know, exactly. The metal band or something? To start, a, to start a new cult called Judasism, right? Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> but it's like it's like Judas went off to India and became a Buddhist. Um, <laughs> all right, I'm done. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I was going to say, you know, instead of breaking the law, it's like, you know, don't do bad, like, don't ignore bad rules. <laughs> you might right. know what it's like. That's amazing. Um, anyway, though, so if you were to ask as a non-reformed person, if you were to ask me the question, was Judas determined to do what he did? Was that part of God's divine decree? Was that predestined before the foundation of the world? I could confidently say yes. And then if you turned around and, and asked me, was Judas free to do as he did? I would also confidently say yes, because from, from our perspective, there is no contradiction in those two things because of the creature-creator distinction. That's correct. I would agree. I would agree with that, yeah. Yeah. That's correct. Judas so it's kind of like an animal. No. Well, hold on now. I didn't get to finish my thought. It's kind of like an animal, you know. It's like you know, cats. You know, it's like you know, they got like natural instincts. They go naturally do things. You know, uh, it's it, you know, cats go chase after other cats, right? It's like it's not. It's not. It's, so that's kind of like already built in their nature. Is that what you're saying? So it's like, yeah, it's got free will, but it's just always, you know, it's. Uh, it's well, nature was always like this. The, the nature of man was not always fallen, but it has become fallen due to the actions and arguable inactions of his forefather, Adam. So as a result of that, it's not that man is incapable of doing altruistic deeds. He is. He's capable of giving a thousand dollars to his needy neighbor who's about to be evicted so they can pay their rent. But it's not his inclination or his general nature to do that. He will only and always do that which is according to his depraved nature. Does that make sense? Yeah. So the so so I another important, so another important point would be uh, how Chris and, and others uh, view man's nature and how he can function within that nature or outside of that nature if he if he can. So in other words, uh, if he is depraved, whatever that you believe that means, can he then do the contrary to that? So can he choose to do good things that would bring salvation or, or so on and so forth? And, and that's well, where the Reformed reply, he can do good things. He cannot do good things that would work toward his salvation. Well, yeah, no one can do good things that can work towards their salvation, though. No one believes that, except for, you know, non-believing the, people. The, Pela the Pelagian and arguably the open theist would. But what were you going to say, CJ? Uh, so I was going to well, – there's actually uh, two things. One quick note just to piggyback off that. I actually – there's a – because one of the questions very commonly asked of Calvinists is whether or not we think faith is a work. In case anybody interested is interested, uh, there is a portion of uh, the the work I recently published that is actually on specifically that. Um, the long and short is the answer is no. We do not believe faith is a work, but that is precisely why we argue as we do. And right. um, I'll, I'll leave that there because I think Ryan and uh, I can never rem remember your real name, SS. It's terrible of me, but um, Brandon. 
Brandon, thank you. Well, you you've now educated me because I've only ever called you SS21. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and uh, anyways, though, so that uh, that being said, too, the other thing I wanted to add here, and this is a very important point, is what we're claiming about the the limits on man's free will, um, it, it being that they are limited to to something within the confines of his own nature, right? It, uh, these are things which Christians generally already affirm, but about God, right? So in other words, for the majority, I'm sure there are Maltheists out there who would disagree with this, or maybe some, some weird philosophical, uh, you know, kind of like platonic Christians, if, if somebody could even be called by such adjectives. Um, who would, might disagree with this, but for the most part, the majority of us agree that there are certain things God cannot do. And they're not things, as I was explaining earlier, they're not things he cannot do because he's incapable or because he doesn't know how. He just can't figure it out. It's like a puzzle piece to him, right? No, it's nothing like that. Um, it's because he has a certain nature about him that prevents him from doing certain things. So he's not a liar, because his nature is not is to tell the truth, and so therefore God cannot tell a lie. It's not it's not like he's somehow less omnipotent than I am, right? I can tell you right now that I'm a eight foot tall pink platypus, and that would be a lie. And it's not like I'm I just demonstrated more power than God did. All I did is demonstrate a different nature than God, even if it was just to demonstrate a little bit of a point, right? So, and and this leads me to a fundamental question. It is, and I don't think you intend this, so don't take this as an accusation. I don't think anybody intends this. But you must admit it is a certain kind of bizarre level of arrogance for mankind to think that we have a fully autonomous will, meaning not bound by our own nature, when we won't even affirm that about the creator of the universe. Um, if he is got a nature about him that prevents him from doing certain things, an internal nature, not some outside force, it's all him, then the audacity to think we would be any different, that we would actually be more powerful, we can circumvent our own nature, but God can't. That, to me, that is truly absurd. Um, and, and I would argue it's even, though I don't think anybody ever intends to do this, I think it, it, there's a certain level of arrogance behind it. Um, and, I, and I also think as a result of questions like this, at least from a theistic worldview, I could argue philosophically as well, and I think this applies philosophically, but we're not going there right now. At least from a theistic worldview, uh, libertarian free will is is complete nonsense, in my opinion. It's, it's ill-defined. It cannot possibly exist within the confines of what we affirm. Um, and it it's something that... Be, go ahead, sorry. I, I was just going to quickly wrap up by saying, and it's not even something that the majority of us affirm um, for God himself. So if, right. if he doesn't have it, there's no way we can have it. Right. That's a good the, point. Only good point. the only people who could truly affirm libertarian free will consistently would not be an atheist, but a nihilist. End of story. You, if, the atheist kind of sort of could flirt with it, but really the, the idea of a truly libertarian or free will is is ridiculous several factors we don't have the capacity to turn into dumbo the elephant because we want to do it uh, otherwise i'm sure every five-year-old would have thought of that <laughs> you know that's a bit of an absurd example but i think it illustrates the point there, there are limitations on the creation we cannot uh so, will him huh? i would say so so the question needs to be is what's the limit on our will, right? What does scripture really, say yes. about that limit? The, the, really, that is the heart of the Arminian or Remonstrant debate with the Reformed and Lutherans. The Reformed and Lutherans have each agreed that, again, there, the idea of will is not free, and hence Luther's famous work, The Bondage of the Will, and Erasmus' famous work, The Freedom of the Will. The, the, the extent to which Erasmus was arguing the freedom of the will, if you read his book, is not that man can do whatever the daylights he pleases to do, but that he was free to choose to believe 
and free to walk away according to the capacity of his will. But the Arminian would still be forced to affirm that he couldn't simply decide to believe one day. It still required pervenient grace from God. The, the whole debate has centered really around the extent and limitations of human volition. Yeah, yeah. And so I guess it, it, Chris would need to uh, define his position on that. I'm not actually, I'm not even sure. Well, my whole thing is, as far as uh, the whole libertarian free will argument, it just goes back to my example I made earlier when I said, you know, if I create something and I, ha I have a design purpose in mind and it goes against that design it, and then I give it a free will. So now, even though I design, like, let's say I design something to go up and down the road really fast, that's all I designed it to do. But it wants to sit there and just go backwards really slow I because I gave it free will. Well, now... Even though I, I, even though I designed it for one for a certain purpose, it's designed to do another purpose because I gave it a free will. And so, like when man was created in the image of God, you know, we were designed to be an expression of God, right? So, but we also have a free will, and we can decide whether we want to express godliness or not, and 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 manifest that image out into the world. So, I would say that you know at that that that's what I think our free will is we can either act accordingly to what our design was or we can act against that design okay, okay. it isn't so, just that i can turn myself into dumbo or something like to me that's not that's not exactly you know free will that, well, that doesn't yes, really mean you, anything you are, you are well, no it does mean something because you're not thing truly as a free will you're also acknowledging that man does not just come to christ because he feels like it so you are at, at right there at that base level you are admitting there are limitations to what you mean by free will well and briefly I now would, that's I would power add. i would say that's power that's not free will that's like power I mean, you know, I can just, be, you know, do whatever I want. You know, I think that's, th okay, that's there's so a difference between free will and power. There, there, There is a reason why the reform become irritated when we talk to you, because we just explain to you the whole thing. And the minute. Yeah, that, if I have a gun, I minute, can't shoot the minute, you. The minute that we are trying to have a reasonable discussion, you just redefine something. It becomes very annoying. Please no, I didn't ahead. redefine it. You are trying to define it a certain way, and it's not that way. Because, look, if I want to kill you and I, you're not around, that's not like, uh, oh, you know, I mean, like, uh, that my will just cannot act on it is all. I, I got the free will. It just it doesn't have the ability to act on it. Now, if you put a gun in my hand, now I have the power to act upon what I want to do, which, which is which shoot would you. Involve, which would involve, if you said, if you put... Not I put, you put. That would now involve another source of will. But I think CJ was going to say something. Well, I, I think there, the first thing I would want to add is, is the, the issue of the, the car example, which to be fair, is, it's an example I'd like to address here in a moment. So I'm not going to dismiss it. But I would just have to point out it doesn't actually solve the problem that I had laid out earlier, right? So this is typically this is what in a debate setting would be would be known as a red herring. And, and the reason they call it red herring is just because it's not it doesn't directly address the claim made, which is not to say it's an unfair point. It's just to say that it, it does ultimately divert from the original point made. Right. Which, if you recall, was this idea that if we are going to affirm there are certain things that limit one's nature, not just for us, you can't flap your wings and fly, but also for God, he's, he's not capable of lying, then it, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to argue that that fact in and of itself, being limited by one's nature, diminishes freedom of will, unless we are just going to conclude freedom of will does not exist, which, to be fair, I'm not willing to do. Uh, and neither are the historical reformed uh, leaders, whether that be Beza or Calvin, or you could even say Luther, although some would argue whether or not he counts. I think he counts. Anyways, um, you know, or even modern guys, Sproul, Wilson, White, etc. Um, 
So the, the second thing, though, besides that, besides the fact that this illustration doesn't, I think, get us out of the issue, is that the illustration, um, it, it only works given a certain direct line. What do I mean by that? So if I design, you brought up the car, right? So let's just stick with that. If I design a car and the car doesn't do what I designed it to do, then I can say that the car is in some sense deficient, right? Which is, which is essentially the claim you're making only with the addition of free will. Like the, the thing is making itself deficient, right? Um, right, or else I would have to blame myself on it. Right. So that, that because the direct connection between your hands, the, the work of your hands, I mean, and that car... Um, you can you can make a, a claim like that, right? But there's an a form of an indirect uh, creation, an indirect work of your hands, where such is not actually the case anymore. This is why reformers are very often fond of the author analogy, right? So you, the when you take a author, let's just say for this example, George Lucas, because I assume virtually everybody here is is familiar at least somewhat with the Star Wars story. Um. You know what the what the will of Lucas is by following the pattern of the story. In other words, the expression of his will is most clearly formulated in the form of the protagonist, right? Otherwise, he wouldn't be the protagonist. He'd be the antagonist. The very fact that he is the protagonist means that that is the, the, uh, the greatest expression of his will within the story, which is why that character ultimately wins, why he's the good guy, why he's the main character, so on and so forth, right? But of course, it's also his will to create the antagonist, of course, because he's an author, right? That's, that's just the very nature of being an author. So even though, by definition, the antagonist is at odds with the greatest expression of the author's will, namely the protagonist, it is also true that the antagonist is doing what he was designed to do. And the reason that you can have both of these things existing at the same time is because there is a kind of indirect causation between that. You suspend your disbelief for a moment when reading the story so that you can kind of pretend that the antagonist and the protagonist are real characters and therefore you place the motivations upon the characters rather than placing them upon the author himself, right? So that's obviously an example of fiction, but in God, you have the same general premise, but of course amplified to an extent uh, uh, because of the reality that we have uh, play at play here, right? So the greatest expression of God's will is found in his son, first and foremost, uh, his church, uh, his word, his law, and so on and so forth, right? But that does not necessarily mean that he has not also brought forward those other things which are against his son, his church, his law, and so on and so forth, um, and brought them about to do precisely what exactly they are doing, right? So, and this is why we have things like secondary and primary causation. I, I hope I'm explaining this in, in a clear way for you guys because it is kind of a difficult concept to, gr to grasp but nevertheless I'm it so far so you're doing all right i appreciate that um but nevertheless the, the point there is just essentially to say and i'll wrap up with this because i don't want to drag it too long the point there is just to say that this this secondary agent has the ability to act on a genuine free will but that genuine free will is is something which was brought out um, by that primary cause who is ultimately determining all things towards his revealed purpose, which in our case is the glorification of his son and, and the uh, glorification of his body. Okay. Um, see, I, I guess... Um, how can I best articulate this? Um, if someone else has a point they want to add, go ahead, because it's going to take me a second to kind of wrap my mind around that. No, that was really well said, yeah. I'm, I mean, 
what I've noticed is, uh, you know, philosophical debates can go back and forth. There's a lot of good, really good, uh, compatible philosophers that can debate their position really well. And I think better than a libertarian free will position. But ultimately, what I think it comes down to, and I think we can all agree on this, is what does the scriptures teach and show us about man's will, God's will, God's nature, our nature, so on and so forth. Because we can create these these uh, analogies uh, to uh, kind of support our position, or we can um, create these philosophical arguments to support our position. Those are all great and everything, and I enjoy hearing those because I'm not you know the best at doing that. Uh, but w what does Scripture say about all this? I'm sure all three of you were actually right and left, so. You too would also agree with me on that, I believe. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, it, it's just, I guess my whole thing is it, it just comes back to you're basically saying that God could anticipate every decision we're going to make and done. I, I, I like, I, like, okay, you can sort of start to predict what your kids are going to do every single day, what everything in your ha everyone's going to do in your house every single day. You start to predict, like, everyone's actions. You know exactly what you can do to, to change the whole vibe of your house, little things you can do, little things you can set up. And so, I mean, so I understand that God can sit there and, uh, and, and determine everything. Now, I almost say determine, but God understands how everything's going to unfold, and can and can interact with His creation to, to I guess to have it directed towards a certain point. Just knowing the state of man, and already knowing like the wickedness, like some man might have in his heart, or many men, or almost all men and can direct something towards that cause can direct things to make people realize they're evil and 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 i guess work the greatest good out of things right it's just that when it comes to like saying that that you know man's determined or can't make a free will decision that's just where i i, I just um i i just it just doesn't jive with me because it, it just seems like it sounds like when I'm reading the Bible that man has a, a choice and a will and that God's trying to persuade him. And if he can't be persuaded, it's like I, I'm it's just I just really have trouble understanding the whole determination thing. I mean, it's like people want to say God can understand everything, all things no, and works all things for good. That's fine. That's where I stand. Like I can have complete free will and God can still understand how to work everything towards good, you know, and, and work everything for the greatest good and his greatest purpose and everyone's greatest good. But, um, I, I just don't get the whole no free will thing or compatible thing. Cause to me, it's like, well, I already believe in a free will. So if you're just saying it's compatible with what God's going to determine, I don't know. I kind of throw my hands up because my my biggest sticking point is just we got to have free will. But I, I I guess the main thing would be is that you just think it's like it's so depraved and or like you're just already like set in stone with a depraved nature and that God's got to actually I don't know decide to choose you to save you. Is that it? Well, so let me kind of give a. A biblical example of what I'm talking about because I think first off I just think Brandon was right in that the the philosophy of the matter is is important but it's not the most important thing right um, quickly before I do I want to caveat by saying the interesting thing about what you just said is I almost am in a, am in a hundred percent agreement with you um, obviously there is a there is a difference um, between what you would say and what I would say because of my affirmation of compatibilism. But as far as the, you know, it does seem to me like the Bible presents genuine choice. It does seem to me intuitively obvious that man is, is free to some extent. And it does seem to me like justice, if it's truly justice, must include 
some real capacity to do otherwise. And I, in those three elements, we would actually be in perfect agreement. And I, I think I can say boldly, the majority of Calvinists would be in agreement with us. Though, of course, not all. I'm not going to claim to speak for everybody. Um, but to give you a, a biblical example of this sort of compatibility at work, right? If we were to go to Acts chapter 2 or Acts chapter 4, both of them speak about the, this particular incident. And um, the verses at the top of, are not coming to me at the top of my head, but I believe it is 19 through 23 in chapter 4 and uh, maybe 18 in chapter 2. Um, I got it up if you want to read it. What version would you prefer? Um, I, I typically read out of KJV, but uh, my, I'm not super picky. As long as it's not the Jehovah's Witness. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on, let me pull up the New World Translation real quick. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, all right. So let's see here. Um, Looks like verse 23. Yeah, 22 there is where we'd want to start. I appreciate you. Um, so it says... Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know, him being deliver delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain, whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be hidden of it. Now, pause really quickly. Uh, we, I first want to note the obvious, which is by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, right? Um, so God determined, it says it explicitly in this particular case, to give Jesus and deliver him up to the Jews, right? But the second thing, which may not be as obvious, because it's not, it's not the drawing language that catches your eye, it's not the highlighted stuff, so to speak, to use a metaphor, right? is him, uh, after this, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. So notice the, the moral impetus is actually placed upon, it's the crowd in this instance, but to be explicit, those who crucified Jesus, right? He calls their hands wicked and he says, you by wicked hands have slain. So he's affirming that they actually by, from their own will, they chose to do this, and as such, they're morally culpable, even though it was by the determinate counsel of his will, right? Now, uh, Brother Brandon, if you would, uh, can we go to chapter 4 real quick? Yeah, you got it. Thank you. And in this passage we're going to read, it's not a parallel passage in the same way of the synoptics, but it is... Um, an apostle speaking about the same thing. That, that was Peter. I believe here it's going to be Stephen, if I remember correctly. But, um, so he says, and we'll start here. Let's see. Um, I think it's 28, 27. Um, yeah, 27. Actually, we'll start with 26 just to get the full context here. The kings of the earth stood up and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For of a truth against the holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together. Now notice this. The word for is essentially a way of saying this is the reason, right? You might even say it's, it is because, but because is not always fit perfectly in the form of the sentence, right? But that's what the word for means. Like if I said, I came here for my keys. I'm saying here, I came here because my keys. I came here for the reason of my keys, right? So just bear that in mind here. For of a truth against, or excuse me, for to do whatsoever, I already read verse 27, my bad. For to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done, right? So, so here, the apostles are praying, saying that Pontius Pilate and Herod rose up and they were to do 
only that which God's determinate counsel had already predestined them to do. But again, notice where the moral impetus lies. It's, he says, Herod and Pontius Pilate rose up. So the Bible here is providing, and this is only one instance. I, I, I freely admit that the legwork to say this applies to everything is on me. And if you were to say, okay, this event is, seems like this is true, but I don't know if I buy it for every event, fair. I don't, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. And, and I think that'd be a, a Berean way to go about this. But nevertheless, what we see here is the scripture telling us both that these men were wicked in doing this and that they are the ones who rose up to do this. In other words, it's an affirmation of their will and their willingness to do what they did in, in crucifying Jesus. Coupled with, or you might say compatible with, the idea that God had actually explicitly determined that to be done. And this is the really important kicker here. What that means is, even if I'm wrong, or I could say even if we're wrong, as, as Reformed brethren, even if we are wrong about the ultimate nature of the will, it still cannot follow that this A, is illogical, or B, violates God's holiness, because if it happens even one time, it can't be illogical, and it can't violate God's holiness. God wouldn't lie even once, so therefore we know that this is not a violation of God's holiness. And something which is illogical, by definition, cannot happen, right? You can't have a square circle. That's why it's illogical. If you could have a square circle, it, would, it wouldn't be illogical, even if it only happened one in a Google Times or one in a Marioplex Times or, or some other extravagantly large number with an ungodly number of zeros behind it. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know what I mean? So, so these two verses together, I think, very, can very clearly illustrate the point that while we have legwork to do to see whether this applies to all of mankind, and I think that legwork can be done, it certainly follows that we cannot claim compatibilism is illogical, unbiblical, or somehow besmirches God's holiness or man's culpability. Uh, because these verses, in as explicit a manner as I can imagine, say that, that Judas and Pontius and Herod and all these others freely chose to do what they did and were wicked for doing so, while also saying this is what God determined to be done. This was the plan all along. Yeah, that was well said. Yeah, yep. I'm not sure if Chris is gonna. Yeah, I'm trying to think, man. Like how to best um, respond to that. Um, because I, I guess I always saw things like that more as like God already kind of sees the kind of person Judas is, gave him plenty of chances. And then just sees a way of using him to accomplish a greater purpose of his will, even though. So it's like you can determine these things. Like if I have someone that's going to like, like I could determine if I fight someone, like I'm determined when I fight them that I'm not going to guard my head because I because I already know they're going to attack my body and it's harder to hit my head. So I'm just gonna hold my guard down, and I'm so I determined to hold my guard down. You know, it's like, so it's like when I think of the words determine and see those words in the Bible, I'm thinking more of like it in that kind of context, not as like God sat there and determined like like I'm 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 gonna make these things happen. It's like it's more or less like. I determine because I see how everything's operating that I'm going to maneuver everything at least to this point to accomplish my will and purpose. Yeah, so how, I. Sorry, go ahead. Well, I was. I was just yeah, I mean that's. It. Oh, go ahead. How, how do you understand uh, this verse I have up? Acts, chapter one, verse sixteen. You're going to have to read it to me because I'm driving. <laughs> yeah, no, no, that's right. I actually, as I was sitting there, I was like, oh, yeah, that's right. He's probably driving. Uh, it says, brothers, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke beforehand by the mouth of David concerning Judas, 
who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered among us and was allotted his share in this ministry. Now this man acquired a field with the reward of his wickedness. And falling headlong, he burst open in the middle and all his bowels gushed out. And you can read more for the context if you want. But I think this is another example, like you brought up with Judas, that uh, although he had his will and he was functioning as he desired, um, this was actually prophesied uh, by David, by God through David, about Judas, who was to come later on. So it seems like, at the very least with prophecy, uh, here this would be a set in stone type of thing and yet a compatibilistic type of thing or event or however you want to word it i can just i just think god can cause certain circumstances to where judas could have been like um like a a criminal you know and just like well i'm gonna maneuver things into where he becomes a disciple you know like uh, so I just don't see, like, I, I don't think, like, he created Judas for that purpose, because then if he had created Judas for this purpose and had that purpose in mind, then Judas actually couldn't do any wrong because he did what well, he, he did according to his created purpose. It just goes back to, like, when I, if I design something a certain way, if I give it free will, you know, it's and it goes against what I designed it to do. Well, then now I can say it's working wrong, but if God created Judas and, and like he does exactly what God was hoping he would do uh, when he created him, then Judas did everything right because God created him for that purpose. That's why I said he has to have, he has to have free will. That way he acts, he does something wrong and he, God could actually punish him to hell or else I don't see how he could punish him to hell if he doesn't have but any kind of free will and that's how god created him because now he's just acting according to his purpose because it's like i can't get mad at my cat man when it pees because the way it is it's like an animal that's designed with certain instincts that when you know oh okay it's in distress it's gonna pee all over the house because i brought a strange cat in the house and i'm not gonna get mad at it you know it's because that's just that's just its nature that's just it's that's how it was designed to do, you know, it, that's, that's just what was designed to do. Cause I don't think, I don't know if animals really have a free will. Um, so I actually, am going to have to hop off here pretty soon, but before I do, I, I have just a, a quick question. Uh, and I'll, sure. I'll give you the, the final word on this, Chris, and I appreciate the talk. Um, oh yeah, hey, I appreciate it too, CJ. Yeah, absolutely, man. Anytime. Um, and, and thank you also for hosting, Brandon. Um, so I just wanted to ask, in your view, because you had talked about the the kind of the kind of chess master sort of view, right? Where it's like he already knows if A then B, right? And so he orchestrates it all in such a way that he gets exactly what he wants. And while that's not identical to my view, certainly. I, I actually am kind of agreeable to it in that I think it, I think that a, a reformed view could encompass that view, and I don't think a non-reformed view could. So, so my question is, as far as as far as determining is concerned, when we say God has predestined these things to occur, right? In your view, what's the what is the practical difference, not the the actual difference in in mechanization because of course we can all see what the difference between saying you know forcing somebody to do something or pushing somebody to do something or possessing somebody to do something or orchestrating something all right those are four different kinds of causation certainly um but as far as the pragmatism of the matter what do you think is the difference between me causing somebody to strike me and me pushing somebody's buttons in such a way that I know there's a 100% chance they will strike me. In other words, what's really the difference between determining by way of orchestrating the matter and determining by way of forcing the matter, which I don't think either is, is particularly, uh, I, I wouldn't call either the, the reformed view in totem, but nevertheless, 
I just wanted to ask that question real quick, and I'll give you the last word. Uh, um, okay. Gosh, man. Um, cause, cause, I mean, in both ways, you're you're provoking it, right? So, like, I mean, well, one way you're provo you're saying, what's the difference between provoking it or programming something? But you know, definitely, if you provoke someone a certain way, it's going to accomplish the same thing as if you programmed them to do it, basically. Something like that. Is that the question? Yeah, I, I think I think you're, I think you're definitely following. It. If not, I'll have to think about it. Um, okay. Because see, on some of this stuff, it's like I don't think God necessarily like. I don't think he provoked Judas to do evil. I think this was probably something to where he was going to do it anyway, and then God just. Um, you know, instead of like, what well, have you going out and committing murder or being a thief or doing this? I'm going to orchestrate it to where a certain thing happens in the course of your day. Next thing you know, you're meeting this person. Next thing you know, you're meeting this person. And suddenly you're a disciple. You know, you're one of the 12, you know. Um, and but uh, but I feel like it's like he already kind of already saw maybe all the way from the, uh, the you know the uh, all the way from the past you know and saw this uh, how everything's unfolding and had already decided i'm going to shape things like this and but to me then it still gives judas accountability because he still chose it's not so much god provoked him right it's just more or less he's going to naturally choose this stuff but instead I, and God knows his character. God knows what he's going to do. But instead of you being put in this situation, what happens when I put the same kind of thief in this situation or the same kind of murderer in this situation? You know, and then he just kind of moves the pieces around so it accomplishes a, 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 a greater good. I guess that's how I would see it. And I don't know if that's kind of not really answering your question or... If, well, um, I, I don't want to comment on it just because I said uh, I'd give you the last word, and, and I, I tend to. Do oh no, it, you can so. comment on. I don't care if you have the last word, man. Well, and, and I do. I do appreciate the the grace there, but um, no, I, I think I think it's okay to leave the conversation there. Um, we, okay, we'll have plenty right. to, Lord willing, of course, we'll have plenty to keep dialoguing on, but. Suffice it to well, say, I do I'll, appreciate I'll... You this conversation because I will say, man, do this. It, it kind of like um, because I get kind of frustrated because I'm thinking that you guys are more in a certain mindset. So it kind of softens me towards Calvinist, you know, instead of having a more edgier me, um, uh, a more edgier. Uh, I can't even think of a good word to say, but a more edgier uh, interaction with them. Yeah, I definitely feel that. I, I mean, I actually, I, I've, I've had my own outbursts recently against people who it wasn't necessarily directed at because of the same things, right? And what I, that was worded terribly. It was just a grammatical disaster. Sorry. Um, what I, what I mean to say is, I, I've had moments where people who did not provoke me have kind of gotten a little bit of my fury because of how bad these conversations can sometimes get. So. I likewise appreciate having conversations where they are not even close to that. Like we're not even in that ballpark. We're not even in that state. Right. So. Right. Definitely. I would, I would definitely agree. And I would personally love to see more interactions where we can show grace to one another while we talk about these things. So I appreciate both of you. Absolutely. And thank you very much for that. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to go ahead and, and hop off here, brothers, but um, God bless you guys, and, and Lord willing, we'll be talking very soon. Yeah, man. Awesome. Take care. Have a good night. Grace, peace. All right. Yeah. See you, CJ. You as well. Good night.